And now, a show with inappropriate language, The Powell Movement. Welcome to The Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week, it's 420 Week. This should be a big deal, as last year, 420 was canceled. And with this cancel culture, we missed a whole once-in-a-lifetime month because last year, all of April was 420. But all anyone could talk about was the cheap beer virus. So this year, my plan was to bring you a 420 episode with one of those dudes who defines what 420 is. He was an early innovator on his skis, who always has had amazing style in everything that he does, even if it is a little dark. But unfortunately, I'm not going to have Rory Silva on this week. The reason why? Plain and simple, I got lazy, which can be expected on 420 week, and spring break also crept up. So Rory, who's a favorite of mine, will be on at some point. And when I realized that I wasn't going to have Rory on, I knew that I had two episodes in the can. And I was planning on posting a business episode with a dude who's the ultimate ski bum executive that also has ties into 420 with his connections to the Grateful Dead. But I didn't take that route. The other podcast I had is almost the opposite of a 420 episode. But after reading John Collinson's latest Instagram post, I knew that I should post his episode this week, regardless if it's 420 or not. Here's what John said in his post. Well, damn, took a heavy slam two weeks ago while in California. The initial impact blew up my knee, and then I kept tomahawking a good ways down the hill, feeling my lower leg flopping back and forth. I was trying to hold it as I fell, but was just holding my femur and feeling the rest just flop. Ended up blowing ACL, PCL, MCL, patellar tendon, and lateral meniscus, plus separating some ribs for good measure. Just had my first surgery on Monday, where they fixed the MCL, patellar tendon, and lateral meniscus. So now we keep that immobilized for six weeks to let those pieces heal before making a move towards a second surgery to repair ACL and PCL. That is an insane injury. It sounds like he completely blew up his knee and so bummed for John as this is a dude who's coming off back-to-back knee injuries and he worked his ass off to get back on skis. And then this must have happened a few days after we recorded the podcast. Like I said, I feel terrible for John, but also know that he gets a lot out of himself when he's hurt. We talk about that and a lot more on the podcast this week. But before we get into it, I need to thank Andy Goggins and the good people at the Ten Barrel Brewery. They're a longtime sponsor, and they always treat me like family when I'm in town. I had an amazing dinner at the brewery, tried some new beers, shredded bachelor, all in the name of Ten Barrel and drinking beer outside. So I want to thank them very much. And again, I want to thank TGR for giving me access to their premium content. I use this again to research Johnny Collinson and watch all his video parts. And there's tons of content out there over at TGR. To get it, all you need to do is head on over to tetangravity.com backslash premium and you will get access to the catalog of TGR movies. You'll get discounts on all TGR merchandise, and you're going to get access to Proform codes that were once only available to TGR employees. So a pretty cool feature with TGR Premium. I also need to thank my other sponsors who make this podcast happen. They're Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Stanley, Elon Skis, and Rollerblade. Now, let's talk to John Collinson. I should start this thing out talking about your Alaska trip because you just got back from Alaska and it looked like the conditions were incredible, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to start out with what I think is the white elephant in the interview, and it's your body. You have the best body in skiing. (laughs) Do you hear that a lot from a bunch of straight guys like myself? (laughs) Um, I definitely get it more from dudes, yeah. Because I'm not going to lie, when you post workout videos, I zoom in and I check out your abs. And I don't think there's anyone else in action sports. I don't know if you could think of anybody that has the type of body that you have. I mean, I'm sure they're out there. Who? I mean, Simon Dumont maybe, but you're bigger in stature, so you take him off the list. But I can't think of anybody else who's just put the work in to make their body like a temple like you have. Oh, well, thanks. I appreciate that. Hey, no problem. Does it make you uncomfortable, like all that attention, or do you like that? I don't know if I necessarily, like, like it in a, like, egotistical way. Sure. But I do. I mean, I really appreciate my body and what it does for me and everything it's capable of. And I really learned to love, like, sharing the ways that I do that. So I guess, like, if it's white and black, I like it. But, you know, it's multiple reasons all looped into one. When you're at the beach or you're somewhere with your shirt off, because if I were you, I would never have a shirt on. But do you ever feel like people are looking at you like you're a piece of meat? 
No, not really. I don't think so. Hmm. How about girls? Do they send you nudes? No. Well, my girlfriend does, but... Okay. Yeah. How about guys? <laughs> no, never gotten a dick pic. All right. Okay. Yeah. I'll say I've been working out a lot more than ever this year, and I've caught myself looking in the mirror here and there when I see a new divot in my stomach or something. But if I were you, I would be checking myself out in the mirror a lot more. I mean, how many minutes a day do you actually look at yourself and you're like, damn, that's looking good? <laughs> I mean, I don't think any more than anyone else. I just, you know, it's just a normal day. Yeah, I look at it as I never looked at myself in the mirror before because I was always fat and out of shape. But once I started putting in work, I was like more proud of myself and I would look at myself a little bit more. And I would think with you, with just all the different things popping out of your body when you're like working on some muscle group and some huge muscle pops out, I would be checking it out. But that's me. I guess you're used <laughs> to it and that's how you are every day. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I get more stoked when it's, you know, like a strength goal of like hitting a better speed on a run or like lifting more weight or gaining weight if that's a goal you know and trying to put on muscle I think I get more stoked like if I kind of hit those tangible goals than like a visible one got to where I would be totally superficial about it all you're more about actually getting stuff done <laughs> and then in looking at how you do things how many hours a day when you're not in full ski mode do you have to be in the gym to look like you are in the off season I definitely spend at least like an hour hour and a half every day working out yeah at a minimum i usually kind of like to run them pretty long hour an hour and a half isn't that long for where you're at but i'm guessing the hour and hour and a half is is very calculated on the muscle groups you're working on and is not like something i would do is probably a little bit more hardcore yeah it's totally kind of dependent on the long-term goal or the short-term goal and what else is going on you know it's like when i was rehabbing my knee, I was spending a ton of time in the gym every day because it was like 100% of my focus was just getting back stronger. Whereas last summer, you know, I spent a lot more time just doing yard work or going mountain biking and then keeping up the training on the side of all that. Okay. And with you, I feel like it's a tale of two people. It's like the old Johnny Collinson is the dude Hadley Hammer once said is the guy that performs best on Coors Light and Chicken Tenders. Do you remember that guy? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And has it totally changed? Like, is John Collinson a different person than Johnny was back then on Coors Light and Chicken Tenders? <laughs> I mean, same person and same goals, more or less, just like a different approach to it. And yeah, I've just like had a bunch of different experiences that have made me make different decisions, I guess, in my day to day. So is it fair to say that in life you were Johnny for a long time and you've almost matured to become John? I would say that's like pretty fair. Yeah. If you're like on the outside looking in, that would be a, a decent assumption. Because I do make a ton of assumptions you'll kind of see throughout the podcast. But before you can graduate from Johnny to John, you have to be born and named. And a lot of people have stories when they tell them to me. I'm like, oh, you were born to be a skier. But I look at your story and the way you grew up. And it's not like you were just born to be a skier. You were born to be a ski mountaineer. And that starts in employee housing and snowbird and like a, a small little room, right? Yep, totally. We were in, yeah, the employee housing at Snowbird at the top of Chickadee. And my sister and I, yeah, shared a 5 by 12 closet that was in the back of the apartment. And my dad like built up some bunk beds and we shared that until... We were 18. We lived there our entire childhood. When you look back on it, is it hard to comprehend how you even did that? You lived with your sister in such a small space, like a pretty much a jail cell with your sister? It is kind of crazy to think about, you know, now just like having all the space in the world or bigger rooms. It's, yeah, it's pretty wild. And how long we did it for, you know, until we were 18. And granted, <laughs> at that point... She was traveling a lot for ski racing and I was kind of starting to bounce around, but that was still the home base. And so, yeah, that's the wild part is how old we actually were. Yeah, it's amazing. And I mean, your dad was a seasonal ski employee. Your mom was a homeschool teacher who did all kinds of odd jobs, I think, as well. So yep. was there not much money in the Collinson household? No, not by traditional standards of normal income. My parents definitely were super smart in the way they made things work and made investments with their time and their money too. It was all to revolve around giving us the best experience 
that they could and that they thought would serve us the best with, yeah, not that much money. You say it's giving you guys the best experience, but from the outside looking into me as well, it's kind of like your parents had you and your sister and they realized they weren't going to change their adventurous lifestyle at all. It was kind of like, you know what, we're going to have kids and we're still going to do the exact same shit we used to do. In fact, Johnny's going to be four years old and we're going to summit Bernier and it's not going to be a big (laughs) deal at all. (laughs) They definitely had their ideals rooted in what they believed to be the best things in the world, which are hiking, skiing, backpacking, etc. And they just kind of like turned the dials down on the intensity, you know, instead of my dad skiing ice climbing routes on two tens, he just started skiing power rounds in the backcountry or whatever it was. They just kind of turned the intensity down to accommodate a family and take some less risks. But they definitely kept up the same lifestyle of just being outside and backpacking, skiing, climbing. You know, I have a kid and sometimes I compromise to some of the things he wants to do. It's like, we won't go ski this weekend because he really wants to do this. But it sounds like with your parents, it's kind of like you were going to do what they wanted to do, although you wanted to do it as well. But there was no choice. It was kind of like, this is what's happening. Totally. It was like, this is what's happening. And then our choice became, you can either like enjoy it or you can be in a bad mood. <laughs> and it wasn't like we were going to sit there and cry ourselves to sleep that we couldn't you know go to the arcade or whatever and see i think the choices they were just more limited and another piece of that was our parents would have a set goals you know like my sister said she wanted to ski race on a world cup level and so my parents held her to that goal you know and anything that would get her there she had to do and even when it was shitty and she didn't want to do it they're like hey you said you wanted this goal you better like buckle down and do it so that was another piece of it too was kind of making us set goals and follow through on them. Yeah, it's an interesting style of parenting that your parents did because, you know, I was talking with my family about you at dinner last night because we were talking about the podcast and I was saying how you guys had to set goals and you had to say what you're going to do. And when you figured them out, you had to do it and your parents were going to push you into that direction where my kid was like, oh, I don't know if I would like that. I'm like, you know what? You might not like it, but if you look at John's life right now, everything that his parents did put him in a position where he is having the life that he wants right now. And given yeah. he might not have had what you have in childhood, because you get to have a lot of things that you want, where he has to have a lot of things that his parents wanted, but it's worked out for him. And there's a ton of different ways to grow up. So it's a pretty interesting thing about the whole goal setting. But before goal setting, every summer when you were growing up, school would get out, you would get picked up in the family van, and then you're pretty much on an adventure all summer, whether you like it or not. Yeah, exactly. Whatever mountain range my parents thought we should go backpack in, that was where we were headed. So we just drive around, you know, do it super cheap, living in the van. You know, we only stayed in a hotel once when the van broke down. (laughs) And sometimes we'd eat at like Taco Bell or something if it was a late night. And those were all like big wins for you, I would think, for the kids. Totally. Yeah, it was like, holy shit, we're staying in a hotel or like we get to order tacos. This is insane. Because they'd always just make it work and plan it out so that we could cook our own dinners and keep it cheap and uh, sleep on the side of the road. Crazy. I mean, I've interviewed a bunch of people. The only person I think that has a more challenging or more uncomfortable childhood as you is Casey Brown, who lived in this remote area where like even eating white bread was like something she didn't get to do very often. And when she got a piece (laughs) of white bread, she thought it was candy. But you guys were living out of the van all summer long. And is your dad just like a badass in the mountains teaching you the holds and maneuvers and how to find and set routes and all that shit as you're getting older? Yeah, totally. And so that was a big part of it. It wasn't just like we were these tag along kids that they were dragging us on their adventures. They put so much trust in us. Like we were their partners in the mountains too. Even though we were tiny little kids, Right. you know, dad's like, all right, if me and mom get messed up you guys got to learn how to drive the van you know so he teaches how to like drive the van when we were tiny like one of us working the pedals one of us steering (laughs) or like we'd be up in the mountains and he'd make us memorize all the mountains around us you know and blindfold us and spin us around and make us be like which way is north what's that mountain where's camp you know so he kind of groomed us to be able to like take care of ourselves in case of an oh shit scenario Yeah, what's amazing is 
there's a lot of people that are ski mountaineers out there that are learning a lot of stuff now and are eventually going to be badass ski mountaineers. But all this starts for you at such a young age. So it's like, even I say you were born to do this, you were born to be a ski mountaineer. What you weren't born to do is have the normal experiences of many kids or most kids. And like, how many movies did you see in a theater growing up? Can you count those on one hand? Not that many. I remember we saw like when the new Star Wars movies came out, we saw one of those in Colorado. We were doing this big summer climbing all the 14ers. And I think the van had broken down. So we like had a big day, went to a mall and like saw Star Wars or something. It was so sick. What was the best birthday present you ever remember getting? They would kill it with presents, but they would buy us something really dope on the day we needed it. So not necessarily on our birthday. It's like, you know, if I needed like a new pair of skis or a rifle, like a hunting rifle, they'd buy that for me when I needed it and it would count as my birthday present. So I can't remember the best one. I remember like my first bow they got me was pretty sick. So it was all useful stuff for your adventures. You never got a Game Boy. I think I had a Game Boy, actually, because we were watching some family videos recently when we were tiny and we'd get like little toys, you know, G.I. Joe's and stuff. But I just don't remember those that well. And given the work situation for your folks, was everything always used like gear and stuff like that? Was it always hand-me-down stuff? Pretty much. Yeah, it would be hand-me-downs. My dad would, you know, like the lost and found at Snowbird would at the end of the year give away lost and found stuff so we'd like poach some stuff from there he had this rule like if we were driving down the road and you see one glove he's like you always pick up that first glove because the second one is probably down the next curve you know yeah. he had all these like funny things like that where he would yeah ground score huh. and then as we got older my sister started doing some photo shoots when we were young for fia and patagonia so we'd pick up some pretty sweet kids gear yep. through those photo shoots. And then those would get handed down to me. So I wore angels hand-me-downs for sure until I was pretty old. Well, I saw you dress as angel accepting powder awards one year. I mean, yeah, even, <laughs> even once I don't have to, you know, it's just in there. <laughs> and then I would think snowbird is pretty much your escape, like the babysitter and all of that. Like everybody knows your dad. They probably know your mom too. And your parents from a young age just drop you off at the hill and be like, hey, we'll pick you up at three? Yeah. I mean, because we lived right there. So we could just take Chickadee to our house. And yeah, they just send us off. I think I was four and Angel was six or something. We were pretty much skiing on the hill on our own. And all the like ski patrol knew us and most of the lifties. So everyone would keep an eye on us, you know, when we were cruising around. I think you'd go to jail for doing that today. It's crazy. I I think there was a lot of things that were big no-nos that we did, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and the way your schooling went, it was different than most people were. I think you did public school in the fall and spring and then homeschool yep. in the winter. And exactly. when you would go fall and spring, I mean, were you like the weird mountain kids that would come down out of their little perch for a semester? Or what was the transition like? Yeah, definitely we were like the weirdos, or at least I was. You know, and it was funny because there would always be the new kids in the spring and then we'd come back and they'd be like, oh, well, look, these are the new kids. We could make fun of them now. And everyone else is like, well, they're not really new. They're just weird and <laughs> mountains people, you know. And so I was like, just never really fit in with a lot of the groups. So, yeah, it was just kind of like the public school system. It wasn't bad. It was chill, but never like made good friends there or had long lasting friendships come out of those. Did you do like the Boy Scouts or were you an Eagle Scout and do you make friends through that or where did you socialize? On the ski teams. So most of the socializing was in the winter. Because she set her goal, Angel set her goal to be on the U.S. ski team and then you have a similar goal, your ski racing as well. So that's where all the friends are made? Yeah, that was kind of our social circle was ski racing. You know, and they had programs of dry land training in the fall. So we'd get to hang out with other kids and kind of train in the fall ski race all through into the spring and then in the summer we were pretty much off on our own and I was ski racing or then free skiing that was the social circles and as we got older you know I like learned how to make some friends in school but it was just kind of tough because their lives didn't really align super well with ours so yeah I mean you're living the climbing bums life it sounds like 
with a little bit of school mixed in. But yeah, it's a totally different world. So you guys are both racing and Angel's having a lot of success racing. I don't think you're having the same amount of success that she's having, but you're both working your asses off. Yeah. Is it frustrating that you're not having the gains that she's finding in racing? No. I mean, a little bit. You know, you want to be good at whatever you're doing. But what I found with racing, my favorite part was that we got to travel a lot, you know. So starting from 13 or 14, we're getting to go in the van with our buddies, you know, and drive to Mammoth or Jackson or Mount Bachelor, whatever it was for these ski races. And they often had, you know, like super sweet terrain parks or it would end up always snowing, especially if it was a speed event. So I just loved free skiing. So I'd like go hit the park or go ski pow or something and kind of used racing as a means to start traveling and skiing. Now it's time for a sponsor break and the 10 Barrel Brewery is such an amazing brand. They totally get all things ski, snowboard, bike and dogs. Yep. Man and Women's Best Friend are not only loved by Ten Barrel, they are now going to be sponsored by the brand. That's right, Ten Barrel is putting together the first ever brewery team of sponsored dogs. And here is how to get your dog sponsored by Ten Barrel. First, post a video of your pup doing their best trick or their favorite sport on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Second, follow Ten Barrel Brewing Company and use hashtag GoodSitSquad, hashtag Ten Barrel, and hashtag Contest in your post. Third, make sure your profile is public so they can see it. The 10 Barrel team of professional athletes, all the badass skiers and snowboarders that they sponsor, well, they are going to judge the pet competitors on their athleticism, style, and personality to find four of the best of the best for the 21-22 season. Perks include a year's supply of Good Pup Sit Ale, $100 to spend at Roughwear, and $1,000 cash for the human. 10 Barrel's accepting submissions until May 24th, and the winners will be picked on May 26th. To see if your dog has what it takes, head on over to 10barrel.com backslash good sit. My next sponsor is Rollerblade, and there are so many reasons to get into inline skating. It's so much easier on the body compared to running, and it's one of the best total body activities out there. It makes exercise fun, and for skiers, it's the only thing that creates the same muscle movements and carving motions that happen on your skis. Rollerblade has crafted a ski-to-skate program over the years, and it's proven to keep you fit and get you ready for ski season. To find out more about Rollerblade and Skate to Ski, download the Rollerblade app or head on over to rollerblade.com. My final sponsor this round is one of my favorites, Stanley. And we may as well start their ad with the most important part. I'm going to save you 30% on all Stanley products. This is an amazing deal that can be unlocked with the code DRINKFAST. That's all one word and lowercase. And you use it when you check out at Stanley1913.com. And if you spend over $200 with that code DRINKFAST, Stanley will also ship you a Powell Movement beanie with your order. It's a limited edition beanie, and Stanley's an amazing brand that I hope you know about. They're the ones that invented the category of keeping things hot and cold back in 1913. Think about that green bottle that used to keep your grandpa's coffee hot. That's the Stanley I'm talking about. They make all the things that you're going to need for your parking lot lunch sessions at the ski hill and your summer camping and RVing adventures. So head on over to Stanley1913.com for that deal. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. Racing doesn't last for a a super long time for you where Angel is full all in. You decide that racing isn't for you. And when you finish racing, it's like you're going to start hanging out at the skate park and skating a bit. Your dad's not too (laughs) stoked on that by any means. But you need to find an outlet. Yeah. And how do you break it to your parents first? Like, hey, I'm not going to do ski racing anymore. It came from them because I had no idea there was another option. I just thought free skiing was fun. You know, and like we had a really sick crew. Mitchell Brower was still racing at that time okay so i would chase him around you know at like an arm's length and watch him ski and i was like this dude is sick and watch him do tricks and he just kills rails i feel like too yeah he used to kill rails and i remember like this one ski race at soldier mountain he went and like stepped down this little cliff and it was the first time i ever hit like a pat down feature off this cliff And I did a big old 360 and like exploded and broke my ski. But it was the best feeling ever. I was like, dang, this is so rad. And so I was like kind of watching some of the race kids do it. But I didn't know it was an option on its own. And my dad actually was the one that came to me. And he was like, you know, because 
I missed every start that year because I was free skiing. He's like, why are we paying for you the ski race when you are off doing this other stuff? He's like, if you want to go do that stuff, we should do that. You know, like you should join the free ride team. And I didn't know there was a free ride team. So it came from my dad, actually. He made the suggestion that I should quit racing. So is that when the goal happens of winning the Freeride World Tour? Of like, hey, you're going to focus on free ride at that point? Yeah, I started free skiing. And there wasn't really a junior circuit at that point, my first year. Because I think Snowbird had one of the first free ride programs for kids. So we ended up traveling around and competing with the adults when they would let us in which was pretty fun. And then the next year, I can't remember what year, it would have been 2007 or eight or something. When you're like 15 is when you first started getting into the free ride yeah. events. When you're 16 is when you really start killing it on them. Really started to do better. Yeah. And, you know, started like podiuming at most of the events. Then it was like, all right, I want to win the overall for sure. So I set that goal for when I was 17. And that summer was when... Yeah, I was kind of in the skate park a lot. And my dad was like, dude, what are you doing? You can't be just hanging out in the skate park. Was that because he just didn't like the lack of structure and really no end goal of becoming a pro skateboarder? Yeah, exactly. I'm sure he just watched me too and was like, this dude can't even land a kickflip. Like, what is he doing? (laughs) Um, (laughs) No, but it was the lack of structure because the ski racing offered somewhat more of a year round structure. Versus the free ski team, you know, it was super seasonal and everybody was just had the free ride, free ski attitude in the summer too. And we're doing their own thing. So he just thought I just wasn't really reaching my potential. Just like, yeah, skateboarding and basically fucking around. So he kind of changed my whole attitude. They threw away all my clothes, cut my hair off. Whoa. So it's serious. They're like, you're going to need a little attitude adjustment, Johnny. Yeah. hundred percent. It was like. You're going to shape up. And he put me in touch with this guy, Willie Benegas, who was a North Face alpinist at the time and Snowbird Ski Patrol. And he just brought me under his wing and we just started like trail running mostly around the Wasatch and started rock climbing. So your dad just like, I'm going to stick you with my buddy Willie and he's going to whip your ass into shape and we'll figure something out. Pretty much. Yep. That's pretty much exactly how it went. And we just started doing these really cool adventures right off the bat because he was training to run the Wasatch 100. So we started doing some sections of that like at night, just this really cool stuff I'd never done before and started to learn how fun it was to have these big days in the mountains, kind of endurance style ish, you know, or like pushing your body somewhat and having that type two fun and it makes you feel pretty good. So then it was after that. He had guided Everest a bunch of times, and the idea kind of popped up between Willie, my dad, and myself that it would be sweet to go try Everest. It had always been a dream of mine to go there. I kind of thought it was the craziest thing you could do. So we came up with the goal to do that and decided, you know, as somewhat of a marketing ploy to, like, try and raise some money because we weren't rich that I should be the youngest person to do it. So that's how the goal of being the youngest person came up. And Everest is one of those things where you talk about cost. I mean, if I wanted to go up Everest and I had a shit ton of money, I could probably pay a hundred grand right now and be in average to better shape and they would try to get me up there. But for you, it's not like you're going to spend a hundred grand and have a whole bunch of porters and uh, Sherpas taking all your shit up there. You're going to do this on the cheap. And like you say, you're trying to create a marketing story around it. Unfortunately, you guys aren't the best marketers at that point, so it doesn't work out. So it (laughs) becomes bake sale style. Like, hey, we'll send you some cookies. Send us some money so we can go up Everest. How much do you have to raise to make this trip happen for yourself? We raised a bit, you know, it's like pretty much all from the community. Some local brands like Black Diamond and Cool pitched in and helped out. But the main chunk of dough came from my parents owning this house in Sandy that they took a line of credit out on. Oh, man. So they're mortgaging their whole life just to make sure that you have this experience. That's amazing. Yep. It was insane. Like, yeah, my parents are wildly believe in my sister and I, which is crazy. So you rally all the money to get to Everest. And 
North Face isn't going to sponsor you because they don't want to sponsor a 17 year old kid who's not sure if he's going to be a climber for the rest of his life. He might just go off and like skiing and that would be a problem because they've invested a lot. Exactly. So it's a good thing for them that they didn't invest in you at that point. But for the family, it's like goal wise, things are back on track for Johnny. You've got the ski contests. Those are going well. And people are finally taking notice. You're not just Angel's weird little mountain brother anymore. It's like (laughs) you've got shit going on. Can you feel that happening, like your confidence building, like breaking out of Angel's shell? Because right now she's a ski racer who's going to make the U.S. ski team, it looks like. Totally. Yeah, it was really amazing. I mean, I kind of felt like I was just in such a bubble, honestly, of climbing and stuff. Because before Everest, we went to Argentina to climb Aconcagua. And it was just so many new experiences it was like, you know, I'd never really been on a plane before, never been to another country. <laughs> it was like all these crazy things, you know, so I was kind of soaking it all in and then going to Everest. I think for the whole thing, I never was looking too much external, you know, so I wasn't thinking of myself as Angel's little brother or this or that. I was just taking things one step at a time, you know, and it was like, cool, today we're moving to base camp or whatever it was. I just honestly, yeah, was staying in my bubble and I didn't have like this great big picture of things that could be or like my momentum or anything like that. Yeah, you're just living in the moment day to day, just taking what comes at you because I mean, you're not planning five years into the future at this point. You're trying to figure out what's happening tomorrow. Totally. And Everest is happening tomorrow or not literally tomorrow, but it's happening. And from what I read, technically, it's not the most challenging peak in the world. No. There is some challenge to it, and you're just a kid. Are there fears going into this one, or do you feel like you're 17 in the best shape of your life, and this is going to be easy? It was definitely fears, you know, because it was like, it was Everest, and it was crazy. But what I've learned throughout all those climbs were, it was like, we would do stuff as kids that were way gnarlier. I feel like, you know, when when my dad would bring us up whatever peak, you know, and we were kind of just hoofing it we'd kind of do crazier stuff. Right. And so it was like the Everest and the seven summits thing. It's like, they're all boiled down to such a science, you know, and there's a few variables you can never control like the weather or this or that, but it's all been done so much that it's like, yep, you spend this much time to get acclimated. You bring this much food, this much oxygen, whatever it is, you know, there's like a formula for it. So once I kind of broke over the wall of, being like oh my god i'm out mount everest this is the craziest thing and then it was like well it's still just like walking up a snowy hill and i've done that a ton yeah. you know so if you just break it down to the most bait you're like yeah this isn't that crazy you know in the actual act of doing it but you walked up the hill a lot more than a normal person would like if i were to go like i said right. i need to be rich and i'd spend a hundred grand and i'd have sherpas but you were like your own Sherpa going up and down, carrying gear up to base camp and advanced base camp and doing that over and over. Does that earn you a ton of street cred with the Sherpas and everybody else in Everest? It was definitely a really cool way to do it. Because, yeah, that meant we got to spend more time with the climbing Sherpas and they're way gnarlier. They were hauling crazy amounts of gear. But I think it was like a little bit of street cred, you know, because I assume they see a lot of clients that don't necessarily carry that much weight of their own. So I think they did appreciate seeing me as like this young kid being super gung ho and like trying to do some fair share of the work. Yeah. And you're going to be on that mountain for like 45 days. So you've done this kind of stuff your whole life. I mean, your parents have put you in a car for the summer and it's like you're on a mission, but it's a tough thing for a 17 year old to have all that time to kill, I would think. Is it constantly climbing higher, acclimating, and going on little climbs just to kill time? It was a bit of that. And then I was in a cool spot because I was super good buddies with the guides I was with, with Willie and Damien. They're my mentors, and they are kind of like in the know. They're cool guides. So I'd get to go hang out with all the guides and stuff when they would go bouldering or, you know, kind of have fun adventures away from all the clients. So you were part of like the cool core kids there on Everest. Totally. Yeah. It felt pretty rad. Like in those times when I was doing the seven summits and hanging with the guides, I a hundred percent thought I was going to be a mountain guide. Cause I was like, this is so rad. Like these guys are awesome. They're super good athletes, like running around, just taking care of business. It was awesome. 
But then at the same time, I was still in high school. So actually at Everest Base Camp, I was like taking packet classes. BYU was offering these like high school classes in a packet. Uh huh. So I was taking those actually a lot of time. Are you Mormon? No. Okay, just checking. No. Whenever I hear BYU, I think about soaking, and then I have to ask if yeah. you're Mormon. <laughs> yeah, no. So while the trip, I think, was without incident, you get your summit and everything, it sounded like yeah. Willie had to help another group, and you ended up helping a guy who was having some issues. What happens there? Yeah, so that one, let's see. There was a few accidents because a storm rolled in that afternoon. We summited at like 8 a.m., I got back down to South Cole at around noon and the rest of the team was pretty high on the mountain still and a bunch of clouds had rolled in. And one of the older gentlemen on our team, Eugene, his goggles had like fogged up because your oxygen mask, it fucks with your goggles. So like his goggles were messed up. He took them off and he got snow blindness. So the guy I was there with, Damien, who was Willie's twin brother, he brought Eugene down and then... Once they got to camp, this other dude, I think his name was Martin, had like passed out a couple thousand feet higher on the mountain. So Willie and Damien went back up to go do a rescue. And I was kind of stuck in the tent. Not stuck. That sounds horrible. But trying to take care of this dude, Eugene, like helping spoon feed him soup and get his energy back up because he was like 65 or something and kind of tanked. So it was pretty surreal. You know, I was like be trying to like help out this older dude but i found a lot of times in those moments it's like when you're so tired and so beat up but you have some spare energy to help someone else out it just like fuels you yeah you know and so you know, i was like 17 and i was like man this is rad i just like summoned at everest and now i'm getting to like help this other guy out and i have the energy and the like ability to do that it, yeah it felt good so it was like a cool experience for sure when you get home from Everest, it's one of those things where I don't think there's a big parade for you or anything like that. It's just like you get home from this big trip. And are you excited to do the rest of the seven summits? Or is it something where it's like you have to do them because you told your dad you were going to do them? It was definitely just excitement. The whole idea started with just Everest. And then we did Aconcagua to see how I did at altitude. And then on the way into Everest, it was like, man, if we summit this, like, that's two of the highest out of the seven, like, we should just go for all seven. So it happened super fast. And started applying for like the Denali permits while we were at Everest and things like that. So it was just still kind of living in the moment, like taking things day by day. It was just that mentality the whole time, basically, of like, all right, we're done with Everest, we had to like prep gear, get shit together to go up to Denali, because it shifted from like this huge expedition mountain on Everest where it's like, you know, you have yaks carrying up gear to base camp, living in a big tent, blah, 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 to Denali where you're like carrying your own stuff on a sled, you huh. know, and then it's the two man team. So it's like re shifting, like, all right, we just had this big expedition style. Now we got to break it down to like everything carrying ourselves. This was learning all this for the first time, you know, learning how to like shop for food for expeditions, what kind of fuel you use or sleeping bags or whatever. I was just learning so much every single time. And there's so many details you have to think about, like one fuel canister that you buy here in the US, you can get to China somewhere and you're not going to have the same converters that are going to work with the gas there. Totally. So there's a whole bunch of things that you're going to learn there. But at this time, too, after you've done Everest, we can't forget that you have another big goal for that year because you do Everest, and I think, in March, right around your birthday. And then going into the next season is the big Freeride World Tour season where you want to win the Freeride World Tour, Junior Freeride World yeah. Tour. So you've got this going on, and this is when you really start firing at these contests where everything's coming together. And is it something where, like, your mind is not on skiing, and that's why you're able to ski so well? It's like you've got so much shit going on in the mountains that skiing is, like, almost an afterthought, and you're killing it on skis? It could have been, yeah, because we were just so busy, like, running around climbing all these peaks. Basically, until September, I was gone pretty much the whole time from March until September with, like, a few days at home in between. And, yeah, wasn't thinking too much about skiing or, like, training for it or what I needed to do because I was often climbing land. 
And then once the contest started, it was just like having fun. And I kind of had this cool, it was like a whole perspective change on like my view of the mountains. And I just had gone a whole year of traveling to like every continent and meeting all these people, seeing how people operate in the mountains. And so I was like taking that back to the junior contest scene. It was kind of a trip and I don't really know how to like put it into words, but it was, it was really cool for sure. All the stuff you're doing in the mountains that can be looked at as like your college and everything. But then when you go to the junior free ride tour, it's like more elementary school in terms of the education that people have in the mountains compared to what you get when you do Everest and the seven summits. So it's like a knowledge base that you're getting that nobody else has at that level. And they're not going to get for like five to 10 years if they're ever going to get it. You know, it was like I hopped on like the Super Mario Kart booster and I got like (laughs) sped up and it was like, damn, I just got all this experience in one year. So it was like starting to get out backcountry skiing or doing photo shoots. And it was like my value went up for people looking at me like, dang, this kid now has all this experience in the mountains. It was a big boost. I think this is all in the same year, but you end up convincing Angel. She's in college at this point because she didn't make the U.S. ski team. Politics came into play and that sucks for her, but it was probably a good thing at the end of the day. Yep. But you end up convincing her to enter some Freeride World Tour events. And that year you go on to win the junior tour. And I think she goes on and wins the big tour. Yep. It's that year, right? I think so. I think it was. It was like 2010, I want to say, or something. Because I wrapped up the Seven Summits in January and then won the tour a couple months later. And I think, yeah, Angel had been competing that year and crushed it. I mean, is it one of those things where you just kind of have to laugh? Like, you know, this girl's a ski racer. I bring her into my world where you think she might have to learn a little bit, but she just comes out and proves to everyone that she's the best skier in the world in year one. And it's like, I wouldn't think it's frustrating for you because it's you're used to Angel being such a badass skier. But it's just got to be laughable. Like, how could she come in and just start winning everything? I mean, I kind of expected it. I knew she would do amazing. I mean, first off, I thought she would just enjoy it more because of, like, the camaraderie. And, I mean, I just thought free skiing was more fun. So I just thought she'd enjoy it more. And then, like, once she started winning, it was just like, yeah, makes sense. I mean, she charges and knows how to bend a ski, that's for sure. Yeah. And so the big deal for you is winning the junior tour punches your ticket for the big show the free ride world tour and i say the big show yeah it is a show it should be a lot bigger but it is a show per se and you end up making the free ride world tour and you're doing okay on that tour you have the north face and smith they've been longtime sponsors black diamonds a sponsor as well yep at the same time i would think with angel's success is it still like a whole bunch of that's angel's little brother even with all the stuff that you've done in the big mountains yeah I mean, I felt like I was always kind of Angel's little brother. And when she retells the story, she says it went back and forth. But I feel like I've always just been her brother because she's just a bit older and I always look up to her. So, Well, there was one shot where she quit racing and went back to college. Yep. Everything started exploding for you in terms of Everest and a bunch of other things. So there could have been a little bit of back and forth. But then once you pulled her into freeride, it all went into her favor again because, I mean, you look yep. at the skiing that she has done and continues to do, and it's like, not that you're not one of the best skiers in the world, but she is one of the best skiers in the world as well. Yes. Another thing you start doing, though, is you start filming. I think you, you start shooting with sweet grass, but your big yep. break happens when Ian McIntosh gets hurt, I think. North Face needs an athlete for a trip. Ian can't go, and you get the call. Is that kind of how the big filming starts for you? Yeah, exactly. I got the call to go to greenland with sherpa's cinema for all i can yeah it's time for another sponsor break and first up is peter glenn ski and sports if you don't know peter glenn well they started in vermont over 60 years ago when retail was king meaning they know people and they know service and they have always supported some of the coolest stuff in snow right now they sponsor johnny mosley this podcast and a whole bunch more to support them back please check out their website, peterglenn.com, when you're shopping. They have all the brands, the lowest prices, and amazing deals. And guess what? They will price match the big internet guys, offer free shipping on orders of $49 and over, and have a truly no-hassle return policy. To find out more about the deals, the sales, and everything going on at Peter Glenn, head on over to peterglenn.com. 
My final sponsor is Elon Skis, and they have been building a cult following in the States for a few years now. Why? Because their skis are better than everyone else's. And believe me, I worked at a ski manufacturer for 16 years. I know what a quality product looks like when it comes out of the factory, and you aren't going to get any better quality than you're going to find with your Elan skis. And that's just the craftsmanship. They ski even better. They're rock solid underfoot at the highest of speeds, yet still lightweight, and there's no chatter at all. And in just a few months, I can feel my skiing getting better. And that's no joke. You will feel the same thing. To find out more about all things Elan, head on over to elanskis.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. The Sherpas were putting out some stuff back then that was just mind-blowing. Yeah. You shot with them for a few movies, I think. Was it like two movies with them? It was two movies over a few years because they were doing like two-year projects. So I filmed with them for that. And then after they did Into the Mind, they started doing more commercial work. So they filmed this project for North Face called Micah to Greenland. So I filmed with them for that. So I had a good like four year run with Sherpas. And then when Sherpas, when you find that you're not going to be in their next movie or they're not going to be making a ski movie, does it put you at square one? Because when you invest so much to be with a, a movie company and your sponsors buy you in there as well, but there's a relationship that's built between you and the Sherpas. They expect you to be on the trips the next year you expect to be on them. And then you don't have them. Are you kind of like at a loss of like, what the hell am I going to do next year? Because I think this is also at the time when you're looking for a ski sponsor as well. BD's not backing you anymore. Well, it, it all actually lined up pretty perfectly because I was still on BD. You know, and I will say they did so much for me as an athlete because they were trying to grow their ski side of the brand. So they were like really pumping me and Angel. That was their whole problem, though, was their skis. Everything else they made were yeah. amazing. It's their skis that were the problem. It was their skis. Yeah. But because we were on their skis, it gave us so much opportunity. And that's what got Angel into TGR. That's what got me into Sherpas. So my final year with Sherpas was actually my first year with TGR. So I was dual oping. I had like one trip with TGR, a trip with Sherpas, another trip with TGR, back to filming with Sherpas. So it filled up my season pretty well. And so I never missed a beat. I wasn't like, oh man, what am I going to do next year? I was super, super lucky in that it just like interlaced all together. There's a little Armada, like you were skiing on Armadas, but they weren't going to let you out of North Face. That contract. was a couple years later. So okay. I was like still on BD for a couple years filming with TGR. And then, yeah, the BD ski program sort of fell apart. And they were just like, we're not sure what we're doing. We'll keep you on for whatever gear you want, but you don't have to use the skis, basically. So both Angel and I bailed on the skis and I went to Armada and did a trip with TGR, skiing on Armadas, but then it just like didn't work out. I think that was the year they signed Todd Laguerre and some of those guys. Okay. It was like right in that range. They were like looking for a big mountain guy, but I didn't quite fit the bill. I think they wanted a head to toe guy and I wasn't willing to leave North Face. So missed the Armada deal. And so I had, yeah, like a trip with TGR, competed in that Cold Rush event in Revelstoke. You got second at that one. Yep, I got second at that one. I mean, we didn't get this slope style day. It was too cloudy. So it was sort of a partial event, in my opinion. But still going against that heavy hitting crowd, because that's one of those things where free ride world tour is one thing. But when you go to one of those Red Bull events where it's handpicked the best of the best and the people that everybody want to see ski, and you're able to pull second. I don't even care what was scaled back in the contest. It's got to feel pretty good, like you're proving yourself among the greats. It was, hands down, one of the greatest weeks of my life, for sure. Just, uh, yeah, getting to ski with all those guys alone. I mean, like, the Pettit brothers, Kai Peterson, Sammy Carlson. Like, the roster was just, was like, oh my god, I'm here right now with yeah. these guys? And then, yeah, like, landing on the podium, it was like, I was through the roof for a while off that one and then yeah it was like just around that time tgr called me and they were like dude we can't put you in the flick because armada's not coming through and north face you know they were trying to figure it out and i was like oh fuck like i just went did a trip with them and then it wasn't meant to be so that was like the year it was kind of like topsy-turvy 
but then I ended up signing with Red Bull and Faction, and Faction pulled through heavy and like paid for my spot in the TGR flick. Kind of, yeah, saved my ass on that one. Can you explain something to me about Faction? So this company, I can't say they came out of nowhere, but they came out of nowhere, and I can't remember the year they started. It was probably in the early 2000s, it seemed like. Yeah, I think it was like 2006. And they came swinging with a team that is just ridiculous. The last time I saw that happen, it was corrupt, and they had this crazy-ass team, and they are spending a ton of money with Faction. They're spending a ton of money on the team, too. I mean, I look at it now, and it's like, Candide, Alex Hall. I mean, there's so many named people. And back then, there was a, a ton of named people. It was a million-dollar team. And how are they able to afford all this? I mean, do they sell a shit ton of skis in Europe? I don't see too many people on factions in the U.S. So I just am trying to figure out how they're able to do so much. Right. I mean, they sell a pretty good amount of skis. But so the company was started, you know, it's like investor-based. Okay. But I'm not totally sure all the inner workings of it. But totally, it, it was like out of nowhere, sickest team of all time and producing, you know, their own movies every year, which isn't easy. But I will say they could operate on a budget for sure. And it wasn't just like spending gross amounts of money at every chance. It was pretty well thought out on how the money was spent, what it went to. Whenever I see a team like the teams they have, I always wonder how they're able to stay in business. But they are able to keep you with TGR, which is amazing because that's a great brand to be associated with. And they're doing so many amazing things. But one thing that I do think is weird is that you also in your career end up filming with MSP for All In. And is that kind of like cheating on a girlfriend? How does that whole thing work? <laughs> it was. It kind of felt like it. I didn't really know what to think, honestly. It was like, yeah, because they're just totally competing. But I think we were filming with TGR. But it got brought up and it was maybe a sticky point with the Jones brothers, but you know, they gave their blessing as Angel put a lot more time in with Matchstick for that movie. And they gave their blessing, you know, and we're like, yeah, it's cool. Like, you got to do you. And this movie's happening and how the storyline went that it was kind of based around, you know, like Michelle, Angel, Elise, Tatum, and stuff. It was a really cool idea for a movie. So TGR backed it. And then once we shot with MSP, it was just like, it was rad. There was no like bad blood or anything. So that was a uh, interesting and a cool year because the focus was on women in their movies, given there was guys in the movie as well. But the focus seemed to be on women and it was an amazing movie. And then the next year they pulled a full 180 and didn't have any women in the movie. Did Angel or you or anybody recognize that? Like what happened here? I didn't. I don't know if I even saw the next one. I can't remember. Well, it was different. People on the internet were definitely talking about how it was a lot less women, but I don't think it was calculated like that. I think it was injuries that happened. Yeah. And injuries do happen. Yeah. You know, so we were talking about that, like it's cheating on a girlfriend. And when I think about girlfriends and families and skiing, it's brands that consider yourself a family. And you have a lot of great brands behind you. You have Red Bull. Who else is paying you to be a pro skier? So, yeah, we got the North Face, Red Bull. Now I'm with Vocal, Dalbello Marker, Smith, Black Diamond, Kodiak Cakes. I don't even know what Kodiak Cakes are. They're the pancake brand. <laughs> okay. But yeah, Red Bull. I think that was it. And I would think when you started and you were just on the Free Ride World Tour and you had three or four sponsors, I'm guessing you were like a 30, 40 a grand year guy. And you don't have to tell me about all the money you make, but I like to ask you about it. But in terms of what's happened with your career now, like is skiing something where you don't have to work at all and you just are a skier? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Actually, I never even knew it could go that way, but I don't have to work a different job. Super fortunate. I just work with brands and ski. The downside of working with brands and skiing is that you're in a high risk profession and injuries happen and You've had back-to-back -back knee injuries, which is just like a killer for a pro skier because when you get yourself back in business after your first knee injury, you got to feel like, Phew, that was tough. I'm glad all these people stuck by me. <laughs> and then you yeah. end up coming back maybe a little too early. You land in a bomb hole. You blow your knee again. And yep. that sucks, but it's part of the game. And for most people, that would be really terrible. But for you, that's kind of where I think your body sculpting kind of came into play. Is that where it started happening? Totally. Yeah. 
you know, I just kind of took the training super seriously after the first knee. And then after doing it again, it was like, motherfucker, like, what do I need to fix? You know, I was like, I know I can go 100% in the gym, but I'm sure there's other aspects I need to look at, you know, like mentally. And so that was definitely through those two years, it was just like, and I will say again, that it's like, I was so fortunate to be a pro skier and not need to work. Like I could focus a hundred percent on coming back to be a pro skier again. Yeah, I wasn't waiting tables on one leg, you know, and then doing rehab at 10 PM at night or whatever. It was like, I had all the time in the world and I can't be like, more grateful for that and yeah that's really when things hit home that it was like I really enjoyed the whole like working out training all that stuff and just knew that it was like a cool aspect that I wanted to like explore a bit this is where the big change happens in you or maybe from Johnny to John because one of the things I noticed here is like when you're going into this injury the first one Angel's a way bigger entity than you I mean she is what people are talking about in skiing and you're Johnny Collinson, a skier, and you're a great skier, but it's not like people are talking about you like Angel. Totally. Then you get hurt, and you start focusing on creating different types of content that's coming out than the shit that you're normally putting out. And what used to be a social media following that dwarfed what Angel had, now you're like three times bigger than what Angel has. Like, she's got like 60,000 people. You've got almost 200,000 people following you on Instagram. Did you ever think that that would happen? No, I had no idea. And when that does happen, I mean, when you see that social growth, do all of your contracts grow exponentially because you're speaking to so many more people? Not necessarily. I mean, it depends on the brand, too, and depends on what they're trying to leverage or how they use their athlete teams. But it did, you know, Vocal came to the table halfway through my second injury. It's like, how often has that happened? Yeah. It was like, <laughs> they saw the value and they were like, damn, we need to like get on this you know and it was like i can only probably thank my social media for that it gives you so much leverage it's like every time you post you can speak to two hundred thousand people especially if someone wants to promote it for you i mean that's what kept me like my brand really supported me through two injuries but it just like reassured them that they made the right choice supporting me in the fact that i was able to grow my social so much you know like through two injuries so I think it, it kind of drove it home for them that they were like making the right call and like made them feel comfortable that they should keep supporting me. <laughs> I mean, you're the only athlete that I can think of that goes into an injury and becomes more valuable when you get out of the injury. And it's just the, the way you live your life and how you show it to people, which is really amazing. Thank you. I mean, it was kind of taking it the same way I took the whole seven summits or anything else. It was just like, the one day at a time, you know, and I wasn't like too stressed about way down the line. And it was like, if I lose some sponsors, I was like, that's the way of the world. But just had to like put your best foot forward in that moment and in that day and like try and grow yourself as much as I could. You didn't go to your dad in October and say, dad, my goal this year is to have 200,000 followers. <laughs> no, that one didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> He'd be like, what does that even mean? <laughs> The okay. internet. Followers? That sounds whack. <laughs> We're not part of some cult, even though it seems like we are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I was talking to this guy who's a pretty badass climber in his own right, Mike Marolt. Do you know him at all? Yes. He wrote this book, and I wish I had the title of the book next to me because I would say it, but everybody should buy it because it pretty much details his climbing career over the past 30 years, and he's really done some amazing shit. But I asked him about you after I had read the book because I was like, this guy probably knows Johnny and he's probably got some beta on him. And I was like, hey, what can you tell me about Johnny Collinson? I'm like, I'm going to talk to him in a couple of weeks. He's like, I don't know him personally, but I saw something that he did in Bolivia in uh, like a Juana Potsi. I don't even know what the mountain is. Yeah, Juana Potosi. And he was like, what he did there was so impressive to me that I look at him as the future of ski mountaineering. Do you think your future has a lot of ski mountaineering in it, especially with all this adventure going on in the world right now? Oh, wow. That's quite an honor to hear that. Um, I've always sort of looked at ski mountaineering and that sort of like adventure skiing as an avenue I want to explore more, you know, like down the road. And yeah, I think I'll just be hopefully getting into more and more of it. I am really trying to take advantage of like more 
action packed skiing, you know, like fast paced skiing at this point. But I still really love, yeah, doing some like ski mountaineering trips here and there and have some like ideas brewing for down the road for sure, depending on what happens in the world. So I'm guessing you love helicopters and you're not totally pushing into human powered stuff yet, (laughs) but who knows what's going to happen in 10 years? I mean, right now, yep, definitely just went on a heli trip in AK. So I appreciate both. You know, it's like, I can't deny that you can really put like your best foot forward when you're getting 10 laps out of the heli and you can like really step it up. But I also love just walking up and putting your best foot forward that day too. Well, as an athlete at 50 years old, it's going to be tough to get in a heli and have someone want to pay you to be in a heli to go to AK. But (laughs) mountain climbing is something you can still do for a long, long time. Yeah, exactly. And it, you know, it just shows you such a cool thing and you utilize such a cool skill set on those types of ski mountaineering trips that it's something that I'm like, I try and work to keep those skills sharp, you know, even though I'm doing a lot more sort of like heli or action packed skiing than ski mountaineering. Yeah. Try and keep those skills somewhat sharp. Okay. At this point in the podcast, I have something that I like to call inappropriate questions. And Mm -hmm. I get someone that you know to ask you three questions and they can be anything. This time I got someone who happens to be your own flesh and blood. It's Angel who's going to be asking the questions. I usually record them and play them back to you, but we weren't able to get the recording done. And Angel emailed over the questions, but you'll know they came from Angel because they're in a lot of code that I don't understand, but you probably will (laughs) understand them. So I'm going to jump into Angel's first inappropriate question, which is, why is your nickname Shooter J? Shooter J. (laughs) Because I'm Shooter J because I can pee the farthest. (laughs) Yeah, I could like pee like 15 feet when I was a kid. Are you squeezing the tip and then letting the pressure build up? Or can you just pee straight out? No, that was just like letting her rip. Yeah. Okay. No pressure holding. And my dad thought it was like incredible. So yeah, he came up with like Shooter J for me. Hey, Shooter J, show my buddy what you can do. Yeah, totally. He'd do that. Like with the ski patrol, we'd be out skiing. And he's like, if I had to take a leak, he's like, John, do the fucking, do the thing. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, hey, buddy, watch my son pee. (laughs) Dude, see how far he can pee. (laughs) All right, we will go to question number two. Why do you love whisker muffins so much? And can you describe them to us? Oh, God. I mean, that's not even inappropriate. That's just embarrassing. But whisker muffins, it's like every animal, every mammal has whiskers. Yep. And it's like where their whiskers come out. I dubbed the whisker muffin. I have no idea like why I love them so much, but I'm just like infatuated with animals' whiskers. And have you ever harmed any animals on your quest to touch their whisker muffins? I don't like to think I harm them, no. I will like, you know, when our dogs used to be sleeping, I would like go in and pet their whisker muffins, but (laughs) never, (laughs) never tried to harm any of them. Okay. And your final inappropriate question was Pot Gut Patrol a success? And what was your uniform? How did you show up for duty? Yeah, so Pot Gut Patrol was a self-inflicted duty. The Pot Guts were like the little ground squirrels that would run around Snowbird. Okay. Yeah, I don't know why, but when I was a kid, I thought it was my duty to like capture and kill the Pot Guts up at Snowbird. You were an animal killer? I We trapped them <laughs> as much as we could, and... I thought like hunting was pretty rad when I was younger, especially, but I'm not. Yeah, it was a bit later. I actually, I did kill a couple of them. Just kids being kids. Kids being kids. I can't remember my uniform, but we try and trap them and like bring them down to a different trailhead or something. But yeah, I definitely did shoot a couple on the front lawn. Well, when I say kids being kids, I want to go on the record saying that I never killed anything. So I was not a kid being a kid like that, but you did. And you know what? I'm not going to hold it against you. I don't think you've done anything to humans. So that's really all that matters at this point. Yeah, it's just the poor pot guts, man. Well, speaking of this point, that is the end of our podcast. And I want to thank you for your time. In looking at your career, man, it's like you definitely had to live a crazy life where it was like you were living the goals that your parents made you set. And while that might have sucked at times, it eventually paved a way for a career for you. So it sucks in the beginning, but it eventually becomes awesome. 
and there are lessons that you learn through life through your parents that really don't make sense when you're a kid, but they do when you're an adult. And then the other part of your life is like you're in the shadow of your sister. And now I feel like you're the one casting the shadow and she's in your shadow because you have gotten to a point where you're bigger than Angel. And maybe in the ski world, Angel's a more household name. But in the world world, your name's going to become bigger. And that's an amazing feat, especially from where you were just like six years ago. Yeah, well, thank you, man. I really, really appreciate it. That was like super fun podcast. And you were so knowledgeable. You like you knew all the details. That was fun. So that was time with John Collinson. And up until a couple of weeks ago, his story was defined by a unique childhood, accomplishing massive goals, and breaking out from the huge shadow that his sister cast on his ski career and becoming his own man in the ski space. But now, will his career be defined by injury? Well, with a lot of people, I would say yes. But with John, he's not afraid to spend eight hours a day in the gym. And my guess is that he's going to be back on his skis in a year with another 100,000 followers that he'll get from his fitness and lifestyle posts. And everyone will get the pleasure of seeing John's abs on the internet a lot more. So I want to wish John the best on his recovery. I know it's a bummer to be injured and he's been injured for two years and he's going into his third. But that is life in the ski business and I'm sure he understands that and I know he'll be back stronger than ever. And that is the podcast for this week. Now, it's time for me to read the review of the week, and this week, it's a good one. It comes from Powday1221. It was put up this week, and it is a five-star review titled, The Best in Action Sports in Business. The Powell Movement is the best source for in-depth action sport athlete interviews and outdoor sports business insight. Powell's excellent communication skills and sense of humor put his guests at ease, allowing him to extract the things you want to know about their experience and careers. With a guest list that encompasses virtually all action sports across every decade, there's someone you'll be interested in, and you'll learn something you didn't know. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll enjoy a nice Powell movement. Well, Pow Day, I want to thank you for that review. I really feel like I put the research in to make sure that these things are the best in-depth action sports athlete interviews, and that is a mouthful to say. But I really do put the time in to get the information that I hope no one else will get. And so far, I think it's been working. And I know there are other great podcasts out there. I just happen to think I'm the greatest. But that's how that goes. I am going to send you a beanie for your kind review. And it doesn't matter if it's a good or a bad review. I will send a beanie to whatever I read on the air. And I really appreciate it when you rate and review the podcast. I will say I got my 10th one-star review this week, which is crazy, but it didn't come with any comments. And if you're going to give me a one-star review, please give some commentary so I can understand why you don't like the show. It's okay that you don't like it. Not everyone likes me. I get that. But that is the deal. So thank you for that review, Pow Day. And if you email me at mike at the with your mailing address, I will ship you out a Powell Movement beanie made by the good people at Cole Headwear. If you want to get your hands on a beanie, you can buy one through my website or you can write a review just like Pow Day did and I will send you one. Here is what you need to do to get that review in. First, click the podcast icon on your smartphone. Second, search for the Powell Movement. Third, click my logo. Fourth, scroll down to where you see the stars. Fifth, hit however many stars you think I deserve and then write your review. It takes a minute and it's greatly appreciated. Finally, I want to thank you for listening and thank my amazing sponsors for making this show happen. They're the Ten Barrel Brewery, Stanley, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, Elon Skis, and Rollerblade. Have a great week, everyone.